Welcome back to another mdct.com.au free webinar on emergency radiology imaging, part four of four. This is the last lecture of a four part lecture series. In this lecture, we will look at the cardiac radiographic appearances and also chest CT protocol development. And in this, with this chest CT protocol development, we're going to show you exactly how to reduce radiation dose how to calculate it without affecting the image quality. So if we take a first look at the cardiac radiographic appearance. On a PHS radiograph, you will always see on the left side of the cardiac chambers below each hilum that the largest area will be the actual right ventricle. You'll see in the pink area the right atrium. The brown area is the left ventricle and the little green aspect which sits just below the left hilum is the left atrium. On a lateral chest radiograph, you will always see anteriorly the right ventricle, posteriorly the left ventricle, and you'll see most of the actual left atrium. And more importantly, at the superior anterior aspect of the left atrium, you see the left apical appendage. On a PA chest x-ray, you'll also see the inferior vena cava which comes up. So on many lateral chest x-rays, there is always a well-defined vertical shadow which meets the posterior and inferior aspect of the heart. And this is the inferior vena cava. Interestingly, patients who are dehydrated, you won't see this as much. When patients are heavily hydrated, you'll see it quite more prominently. On a lateral chest radiograph, you'll see the shadow just a little bit more and inferior to the heart, which sits above both diaphragms. Importantly, when people start to look at the cardiothoracic ratio, this is more for the PA chest radiograph. If you are to perform an AP chest radiograph, very important to get a maximum of 180 centimeters or 100 inches FFD which is the focus to film distance. This means in a trauma situation, you would always want to bring the bed down as close as you can to the ground and increase the tube to its highest maximum or allowable point. Also in the green where you actually see the yellow dot, you're able to also see the superior vena cava which enters into the first bulb on the right side of the mediastinum this is where the superior vena cava is in the right atrium. If you have a look at the right ventricle and the pulmonary arteries, we see that this is the middle segment of the PA chest radiograph. And more importantly, at the hilum, arteries that radiate out from the hilum and in this particular direction of travel allows them to be distinguished from pulmonary veins. See, the veins will always run towards the left atrium whereas the pulmonary arteries will run out and away from the hilum. Now we can actually see the left ventricle and the ascending transverse and thoracic aorta. This is really important when you're looking for patients who have been in a car accident, especially drivers, and you're looking for a widened mediastinum. You need to be able to have the optimal image quality in order to determine if there is a widened mediastinum which can predict potentially a thoracic dissection. And this thoracic dissection occurs because of the osseous pinch theory. Now the osseous pinch theory is a term that we like to use a lot in emergency radiology where a patient, as the patient's car comes still, the chest will come and compress and hit the steering wheel. And then as the car comes to a complete stop, the clavicle and the first rib come down close to the thoracic aorta or the transverse arch. The minute you stop traveling and you've come to a complete standstill, the forces of energy will push back in the reverse direction, causing it to jump back. And then as it comes back, you have this relaxation and opening of the first rib and the clavicle, and this is where the tearing occurs. And again, if you have a look at this yellow dot, this is where you'll see just below 
the arterial pulmonary window, you will see the left atrium. Interestingly, left atriums, you can see them quite well if you have a left atrial thrombosis and this becomes quite enlarged. So if you have a look here at the different points of the aortic valve, the mitral valve, the pulmonary valve and the tricuspid valve, that will change accordingly. So if you have a look between the, usually the right bronchus sits higher than the left because the right bronchus, the right main bronchus, has three lobes of the right lung, whereas the left bronchus only has two lobes. So on the right main bronchus, it will sit further up on the lateral. And therefore, if you draw a horizontal or a, a line 45 degrees to the heart from the bronchus, you will actually see the pulmonary valve is the most superior and closest one to the pulmonary hilum. And then you see inferiorly the tricuspid valve. When you draw a straight line from the left hilum and it's transverse, when these two lines intersect, superiorly you will see the aortic valve will be sitting there and inferiorly you'll see the mitral valve. So now let's, let's, let's now take a look at CT scanning parameters. So let's take a look at KVP and MAS. Interestingly, the higher the KVP, the greater the radiation dose in CT. And therefore, you will actually get reduced contrast to noise ratio. But let me tell you this. For every increasing step of KVP from 80 to 100, or 100 to 120, on average, you're either increasing or reducing, depending in which direction you're going in terms of increasing KVP, you will increase radiation dose by 33% without changing anything else in your protocol. Here you can actually tell, even if you don't place the patient perfectly in the center of the gantry, then you start to get magnification on your scanogram. Interestingly, this will also begin to increase radiation dose unnecessarily. And with previous CT scanner generations, if you're off-centered, there could be either a large increase in radiation dose without you actually realizing. So even though you set the noise index and the KVP relative to the patient's body weight or patient habitus, it could still change if your positioning is not accurate because the MA modulation takes the linear attenuation coefficient of the scanogram and it gives you the radiation dose it needs in order to maintain that contrast to noise ratio because of the noise index. So let's just take a look quickly at just some few lesions that you'd normally see in a chest CT. If you look at the top row in the top left hand corner, if you have a 120 kVp protocol with 100 MAS, and then this is a low contrast density structure, and then if you give it 100 kVp at 25 MAS, you won't see it as clear, but you'll get better low contrast resolution. Because the higher the KVP in chest imaging, the greater the penetration, the reduced amount of the photoelectric effect, you not and you won't get absorption as much. And so therefore, you're able to see the structures a lot better. Whereas if you have high density structures like blood and fluid, even at 100 kVp and 25 MAS, you're still able to see optimal image quality. Now, if we then go again and compare this to 80 kVp, this is where you start to get increased levels of noise and you actually get low contrast because the level of noise is very high in the scan relative to these lesions. So when producing or performing chest CT scans on patients with trauma, ground glass opacities, high resolution chest, or especially angiograms, you'd always, without reducing the sensitivity and specificity, you'd always want to have 100 kVp at 50 MAS. This is an ideal protocol to use. And so in a recent paper that was produced, that actually looked at the optimal dose levels in screening for chest CT, without the effect of lung nodules, they actually found that a protocol at 100 kVp or 25 MAS was really good. However, 
This then begins to change when you're looking at dual energy. Because with dual energy, even though you'll have a fixed CT scan parameter that you'll use with dual energy, depending on the kilo electron volts, which is the energy level, the actual lesion density and size will actually change. Therefore, if a patient was to have CT scans in trauma or lung nodule analysis, you need to ensure you have the same KVP every single time. So if a patient had one six months ago, you need to go back and look at the chest CT scan. You need to look for the lesion and you need to ensure that the KVP parameters are exactly the same as well as the pitch of value. So now this takes us to pitch. Interestingly, pitch is not widely recognized as a major contributing factor to volumetric changes in lesions and nodules because we have interpolation artifacts. So helical CT scanners are not precisely axial because the beginning of the slice does not match up with the end of the slice. Because as the table is moving, so too is the beam rotating. Therefore, slices are at a slight angle and therefore they start to include an average between these two helical slices in order to give you your image. So if we have a look at the effective slice thickness, this really depends on the slice sensitivity profile. Now the slice sensitivity profile is how many times that beam will actually pass through a particular point of that chest in the z-axis. So with a smaller pitch, you're going to have a very high slice sensitivity profile. With a long pitch, you'll have a small or a poor slice sensitivity profile. So therefore, when you're comparing the difference between do we use axial or do we use helical, helical is optimal, but we can know which sense slice sensitivity profile it will give us based on which pitch value we select. So if we want to talk a little bit more about pitch, it's the parameter that is commonly used to describe the table movement of the CT scan. So what it is really is it's the table movement per 360 degree rotation of the X-ray tube, which is then divided by the X-ray beam collimation width. So if your collimation width is 10 centimeters and you've traveled uh, your couch by 20 centimeters, you have a pitch of two. So it's 20 divided by by 10. Also, if we look at the different or variable pitch values, here we actually have, you know, the width slice, which is 10 centimeters, and it's traveled five centimeters. So really we have a pitch of 0.5. This will give us a high slice sensitivity profile. Also, it will give us better or closer matching or less partial volume artifacts or poor or less interpolation algorithms that are needed to cause averaging. However, the downside to this is high radiation dose. Again, if you use the same principles at a pitch of one with a slice width of 10 centimeters and a rotation time or table movement of 10 centimeters, we have a pitch of one, which we call this contiguous slices. And then of course, as we saw the example before, you could have a, a pitch of two millimeters per rotation. So if you look at table pitch, there are three types that they look at. So there is the collimation pitch, which is the tube or the table travel divided by the beam width. Then you have detector pitch, which is the table travel divided by the detector width. Then you have your collimation pitch, which is detector pitch divided by the number of detectors. So changes in pitch do impact image quality significantly. So as you increase your pitch, you're reducing your resolution, but also you reduce your radiation dose, but increase the potential for poorer slice sensitivity profiles and high interpolation algorithm voluming averages. As pitch decreases, you increase resolution and also increase radiation dose. So if we look at pitch variations, increasing the pitch will result in scan covering more of the anatomy lengthwise for a given total acquisition time, making it a really fast scan. It will also reduce the radiation dose to the patient and a decrease in pitch will slow down the table speed and a pitch of less than one will result in overlapping slices. Therefore, 
Decreasing the pitch will decrease the amount of anatomy covered per time and increase the radiation dose to the patient. But there is a way around this. So when we look at the application of pitch, we need to ensure that we want to reduce the amount of volume averaging artifacts. Now this volume averaging, we'd want to reduce this by using a lower pitch. More importantly, we also want to make sure that when we're doing angiograms of the thoracic aorta for dissection imaging, you can able to not have these blurred outlines. So this is an example Let's just have a look at this phantom, okay? Because we've talked about this academically. Now let's talk about this clinically and practically. If you have a pitch of 0.5, you have these five rods which are represented in this diagram. You have a 25 millimeter rod which represents the thoracic aorta, six millimeters all the way to three millimeters. And we we'll also look at the CTDI volume which is 162 milligrams. So if we take a look at these images, we can actually see quite nicely our three millimeter rods, very faintly. If we increase our pitch to 0.938, we begin to lose that low contrast resolution. We're able to not be able to see those point, uh, the three millimeter contrast rods, but we can still see the larger diameters of those high density structures. If we go to a pitch of 1.375, we actually re lose complete resolution of the three and four millimeter slice thicknesses or three or four millimeter slice high density rods. Therefore, we actually know that having a higher pitch of greater than one, we start to lose our low contrast resolution structures and something small as three millimeters can make a difference. Then, of course, if you go to a super fast pitch at 1.75, you've lost also your five millimeter and also almost six millimeters. So really depending on what you're seeing in the CT scan, if you're looking for aortic dissection, you'd always want to use a pitch of 0.9 to 1 or 1.1 with a 64 slice CT scanner and above. If you have a 16 slice scanner, one millimeter rotation is also adequate. Now let's take a look at just some protocols for lung nodule analysis, which will then further go into also trauma for vascular and AVM imaging. So if you have a patient here, this is a typical option, 120 kVP protocol, our rotation time is 0.33. So by the way, these tables are taken from the manuals. These manuals of all of your CT scanners are present with every manufacturer. So if I'm using the fastest rotation time, which reduces the amount of respiration artifacts, I have a pitch of 0.8. My maximum effective MAS will be 239. Now let's take this to the next level. If I just increase my pitch to 1.1, because this is a 64 slice CT scanner, keeping the rotation time the same, I will actually reduce my effective MAS to 174. So this gives me a 27% reduction in radiation dose due to pitch. Now, if I then further change this to 100 kVp, and I know if I go from 120 kVp to 100 kVp, I'm going to save a further 30 to 33% in radiation dose. That is 57% radiation dose reduction. So if you need to go back to your manufacturer's manuals, take a look at the rotation time of the temporal resolution, the pitch values and the effective MAS. Now let's look at slice thickness. And then also depending on the field of view. So if you have a very large field of view, but your chest CT is actually small, then you're actually stretching that pixel and that potential lesion to be quite larger and you'll be not well seen because you have the stair step artifact therefore always with your field of view make sure it is always to the skin line or a centimeter outside the skin line in order to have good reproducibility every single time and give the maximum amount of pixels to cover that area of interest that you require and then also with different slice thicknesses so does the ct or the hounsford unit value change 
So this is important with a very thick slice thickness, you actually have a lower Hounsford unit compared to a thin slice thickness, you have a higher Hounsford unit. So now we'll talk about collimation. Interestingly, attenuation of a voxel is weighted average of the attenuation of all the tissue. And so if you have a very small object, then the voxel cannot be resolved. And therefore we start to get over or under estimation of the size. The best way to do this is your collimation detector with your reduce it, change your image reconstruction kernel. So we always use a high lung sharp window and also for chest CT, we use a smooth filter. If you're doing angiographic phases in trauma CT, you would always want to put a smooth plus filter. And so interestingly, when you're starting to look at iterative reconstruction, if you have it, you're better off using iterative reconstruction, iterative reconstruction because depending on what type you have, you could either have a hybrid type, which uses both statistical models and forward model driven, or you could actually have model based iterative reconstruction, which completely looks at image restoration and statistical analysis. And therefore you're able to reduce the amount of noise because it compares that back to the original raw data. Whereas with the hybrid, it doesn't compare it to the raw data. So if you have a look at these two images here, this is a typical scan of a patient for a chest CT. You can actually see a necrotic lymph node with the zoomed up images between hybrid based iterative reconstruction, which is iDose, which is for Philips. And you have IMR2, which is level two of model based iterative reconstruction by Philips. You can actually see the better image quality and increased resolution and reduced amount of noise. So whenever you're looking at pathology based protocols for chest CT, just that scanning parameters, this is what I like to do. I will always use 100 kVp because you need to remember within the chest, you're only looking at lung parenchyma and cardiac structures. There are no dense structures in there. Even though people are worried about, you know, the shoulders. Again, if you place the arms correctly, not much is seen up there as well anyway, when we're looking at lung parenchymal tissue. Even with angiograms, you can still see it very well with 100 kVp. I always like to use 100 MAS as a safety precaution. My temporal resolution, you'd always want it to be as fast as possible because you have involuntary respiration movements, especially at the level of the diaphragm, when the diaphragm is trying to push up when you hold your breath. And more importantly, always have a small field of view. So if you're looking at scan protocols for nodules, for oncology scans or vascular scans, always remember have thin reconstructions at 1.5 millimeters. For oncology, you'd always want to be two by two millimeters is more than enough. And if you're looking at lung nodules or high resolution chest seat, you'd always have one by one millimeters. So I'd like to thank you all very much for listening to this lecture. Just remember, everything is figure outable. For more free learning and education, please visit us at mdct.com.au. Also, we run a lot of conferences all over the world and please contact us and we'll be more than happy to come to your country. Take care.